Happy Sunday, people. Happy Sunday. What's up, IG? It's been about two Sundays. I did not have my Sunday check-in last week. How are y'all doing tonight? How's everyone doing? We're going to give a few minutes. Hey, Shamitris, I haven't seen you in a while. What's going on? Good to see you on here. Hey, Jasmine, happy Sunday. Hey, Daniel, that's one of my son's friends. Happy Sunday, happy Sunday. Hey, Kersion, what's going on? Micah, what's going on? How are you doing, Anthony? Good evening, good evening. I missed a couple of uh, last Sunday. What's up, the boss wife? How are you doing, faithful ladybug? No, ma'am, ministry does not stop. <laughs> Ministry, ministry probably increased during the, um, the pandemic, Shemitris. Pastor Shemitris, I'm sorry. You were Elder Shemitris the last time I saw you. Now you're pastor. Hey, Erica Ellis, how are you doing? The fire starter herself. Hey, sis, how's it going? Sincerely, Chelsea. We're going to give people a few minutes to come on already. I Thought I was coming on here for one thing. We'll see what the Lord says tonight. Hey, Ashley, Charmaine, how are y'all doing tonight? Again, I am still kind of new to these IG lives. And so I was going to start doing Sunday night check-ins, but I was with family last Sunday. So I did not get on. I waited too late and then I didn't want to get on. Then I was going to come on another night. And you know, such is life. We all get busy. Um, but I did want to try to commit to coming on here consistently to check in, particularly during this season, this time, this climate, um, the climate that we're in. Uh, we have the increase of COVID going on right now. Um, she said, I feel like work is 24 seven. Yes, it is different, but blessed in the process. Yes, because his yoke is easy and his burden is light, Pastor Shemitra. So even though it may seem like you're doing more, uh, when he has anointed you and appointed you to do it, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. What's up from Ethiopia, Australia? Uh, watch the replay as you are at work. Yes. Um, and as I was stating, just um, the, the culture or the climate of our culture right now, the state of our country, and everything that's going on. I know a lot of people have a lot of uh, feelings going on right now. So we've been praying for you. I, I do want to start off by saying this. I believe on Friday I posted that um, my team and I will be praying for you. And so we did on Saturday have closing the gap and we did cover prayer topics. We covered healing. We've covered financial. We covered healing, not just in our body, but healing in our minds. Uh, we covered praying for America, praying for leadership, praying, praying for churches, praying for um, just churches all over the country and churches all over the world. But I do feel led to pray a little more specifically. So what I am considering doing, and sometimes I put it out in the atmosphere to hold myself accountable. I don't know if anyone else does that. Um, but when I look through that list on my post, I believe I posted it on Friday. Um, I do want to pray specifically when I saw some of those. And so I am thinking of recording a prayer, um, just praying for you all and recording it and posting it perhaps on my YouTube channel. I would have to let you know um, so that some people like to hear their name called. And I do understand that. And that's kind of what the Holy Spirit uh, dropped in my spirit. Uh, that some people like to hear their name called, that while we did cover all of the prayer points on Saturday, uh, some people um, like to know that they have that intimate point of connection. Kinesia, how are you doing tonight? Um, and so I do plan on praying, and maybe it'll be me and my team on a Zoom, and then I let you all know that it's posted on my YouTube, that you can go back and just hear the time of prayer that we have for you all. Again, um, on yesterday, I had closing the gap. So I came on for a few reasons. And so um, uh, for a few reasons, 
Number one, because I told you I was going to do Sunday night check-ins. Number two, I want to remind those of you who have not that I am teaching the art of hearing, which is my four-week class on hearing God. If there's ever a time more than ever that we need to know we are hearing God. Uh, right now, I know in our climate, we have people with accusations that um, there's a lot of false prophecy going for it. I do want you to know that sometimes um, a prophet can miss, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're a false prophet. So I don't want us to go to the other extreme of just labeling everybody a false prophet. If we look in scripture, um, Samuel is the only prophet that the Bible verifies that none of his words fell to the ground. Translation, all of his words came to pass. Uh, and so he was um, the first order of the prophets, if you will. He established the order of prophets. He established the office of the prophet. He was the last judge. He was a prophet and he was a priest. So Samuel was unique in his callings. But I, I do want you to say a lot of what we are really calling false prophets are not necessarily false prophets. Uh, in my opinion, it's just what happens when sometimes all of us can do it. All of us are, can be guilty of it. Uh, preachers, pastors, evangelists can be guilty of preaching their message instead of the message of the Lord. And every now and then, the Lord himself will allow um, us to see or us to be publicly corrected when we've done that. And so I leave the Lord's business to the Lord. I'm not here to say one is false and one is not. I do believe that the Bible is clear when he says we shall know a tree by the fruit that it bears. So I definitely um, say, hey, be a fruit inspector. Um, I just know that there's such divisiveness in our country right now that we do not need that same division in the church. And so as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, I am praying that God will reconcile his church first unto him. And once his church is fully reconciled unto him, his church can then be reconciled one to another. Oftentimes we try to uh, reconcile with people before we have reconciled with God. What do you mean by that, uh, Elder Dobbins? Well, sometimes uh, people aren't even... Okay, I don't know where this live is going to go because I've started talking about something I didn't even plan on talking about. So let me just put that little point there. But every now and then, um, sometimes we try to do things in our own strength. We try to make things happen. But there is sometimes we have to go back to God and ask God for the strategy. God, how do we heal our land? How do we heal or restore our family? Our family has been fragmented. God, how do we do it? We all have in our minds how it should be done. But have we really consulted the father and said, Lord, those are your kids. I know I'm your kids right now. We're at odds or we don't see things the same. So what is your will, father? Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. A lot of times we go to God and we pray our will. A lot of times we preach our will. A lot of times we prophesy our will. And, and, and God just wants us all to come wholeheartedly back to him and do what Jesus said he did. Jesus said, I don't speak unless the father says speak. I only speak that which I hear the father says. The Holy Spirit only speaks that which he hears the father says. And I think we get into trouble when we begin to pre uh, preach or speak or prophesy that which is our own will. And so 2020 has been a year of, of what many call a year of disruption. Uh, we felt like the normalities or the norms or the customs or the traditions that we have held as people, not just in the church, but of going, uh, you know, being free to go out to eat, being free to fellowship, being free. No, we don't need new revelation. All, all of the freedoms that we once had to go about 2020 disrupted that. But I want to challenge our thinking. I heard, I, I, I want to challenge that because as I was looking at the word disruption, I began to look at the word interruption and interruption really is not negative. It actually is positive. So I don't believe 2020 was a year of disruption. Many believe it is. I believe it was a year of interruption. God deciding to interrupt 
our will, to interrupt the way we do things, to sit us down, allow us the time to sit down, to think, to reflect. Some of us were too busy. Uh, some of us was even too busy with his business that we didn't even talk to him. We were so busy doing the work of the Lord that we had not spent time fellowshipping with the Lord that we say we serve. And so I believe 2020 has given us an, a time to reset and to reestablish, to repent, uh, to, to realign ourselves back to the will of God, realign ourselves and reconnect ourselves with the Father. And once we have fully reconnected and reconciled with him, that, that family that's been fragmented, the family that's been broken, and, and you're trying to figure out how to put it back together, God said, let me and you get it together first. Come back to my closet. Come and sup with me. If, and come unto me, all of you that are laboring heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you come unto me, when you come to me, after you and I have gotten some things working, out, worked out after you and I have reconciled some things after you and I have talked about how I asked you to do something five years ago I don't know who this is for five years ago but you still have not done it you still have not uh, obeyed you are stuck in the season of saying that you're preparing or you're getting ready to do something but actually you are are being disobedient and so God is saying to somebody tonight you keep trying to fix things with everybody else but come back and fix it with me come back and listen listen Listen, it's much like, thank you, Holy Spirit. Okay, I don't know if we're going to get to what I thought I was coming on here to talk about. But it's much much like in the book of Revelation when, when it was the seven churches and John, the apostle, is writing to these seven churches. And, and one of the churches, God says, I have somewhat against thee. Uh, and so, so some of us, God had somewhat against uh, us, not that he didn't love us, not that he didn't still choose us, not that he still didn't allow his gifts to operate and flow through us. No, but he still uh, understood that there was something between us. That's actually what that means. Thank you, Holy Spirit. There was something between us. There was still a disobedience that we were walking in. There was still a pridefulness we were walking in. There was still something between us that was preventing his his Holy Spirit to work through us uh, at the optimum, at the optimum ability and capacity. Some of us have had things in our heart against people from childhood. Some of us have been struggling with certain issues and proclivities all of our life. And this was the year to sit down with God and say, Lord, you're my father. And if I don't get it right with anybody else, I want to get it right with you. Oftentimes we try to do what the old folks say, putting, putting the cart before the horse. But actually the horse has to pull the cart. The cart can't pull the horse. What do you mean by that, Elder Christie? We have to start with seeking ye first the kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom. And so once we prioritize God and put him back in his rightful place, which should be as Lord of our lives, King of kings, Lord of lords, once he's back in rightful position in our life, once we've given him full authority and full reign over our life again, now we can go and do all the other things. Now the restoration in the family comes. Because what actually happens when you begin to pray to the Lord about yourself and you begin to pray sincerely, he will show you the areas where he wants you to come up a little higher. I have never prayed, and I'll thank you, Lord. I have never prayed to my to the Lord about my husband or about my children or about somebody else and sincerely prayed, and he not first showed me me. See, we keep wanting God to fix everybody else, and God is saying, I'm starting with you. That's why the Bible says judgment starts at his house, at the house of the Lord. Lord. We keep wanting politics and, and the White House to get in order, but actually God wants the church, the body of Christ, to get in order. Judgment starts with us, and we should lead. Uh, once we are corrected, once we get our back in alignment, then we should be the leaders. We should be leaders against all of the oppression that's going on. We should be the leaders against systematic racism. We should be the leaders against sin. We should be the leaders trying to bring everyone together for unity and for healing and for restoration. But until the church gets back in her rightful position and understands that she is the church, that she is the salt of the earth, that she is the one that is supposed to be a light that sits on a hill that cannot be healed. Once the church really rests in her full identity and understand that it is greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Once the church decides that we are one body fitly joined, once the church decides that we're going to work together and that we're we're not going to work against one another. Once the church decides 
decides that the word of God is true and that the word of God is truth and that the word of God shall stand forever. Once the church decides that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life and that the world, the church is no longer open to humanism or secularism or any other ism, new ageism. Once the church decides to just be the church, once the church decides that she's going to serve God and God only, she's not going to just serve God on Sunday and on Wednesday for Bible study, but she's going to serve God every day. She's going to serve God through how she treats her fellow man. She's going to serve God, serve God by showing love one to another. She's going to serve God by leading by example, by repenting openly. When you sin openly, you should repent openly. Once the church decides to humble herself and do what the Bible says in second Chronicles seven and 14, and the Bible says that if his people who are called by his name will humble themselves, and he has to start with humility. Humility is a position of our heart. Humility says that I am now going to do, uh, I am now submitting to something that is greater than me. Humility uh, is in alignment with submission. When the Bible says submit to God and resist the devil, once the church humbles herself under the ha mighty hand of God, once the church understands that if we don't humble ourselves, God will humble us. Once the church fully humbles herself and then does what the Bible says, turn from her wicked ways. Listen, God says my people have ways that are wicked. I need you to turn from the ways that are wicked. He didn't call his people wicked. He still identified them as his, but he is now acknowledging that some of what they do does not look like him. That their ways are wicked. What, what, what does that mean? What does that mean? See, when you operate in pride, that's wickedness. Your ways don't look like God. Wickedness is anything that is oppositional to God. W wickedness is defiant. See, listen, there's a difference in being weak and wicked. Some people have a weakness that they have just not matured in and developed their faith to overcome. But wickedness is a position of your heart. Wickedness is when you're going to do it your way no matter what. Wickedness is when you know to do right and you don't do right, not because it's a struggle, but because pride has set up in your heart and you're going to do things your way. This is not even what I came to talk to you about tonight, Instagram. I really came to talk to you about something else. But the church has got to become unified. The church as a whole has got to get on her face and begin to pray. The church as a whole has got to repent. The church as a whole has got to go back to living according to the word of God. The church as a whole has got to remember that we walk by faith and not by sight. So even when you pray and you don't get the answer that you desire, you still understand that God is still God and that God is still sovereign and God is still in control and God is still on the throne, that he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. So it, it's not, I'm not a child that's asking God to give me something uh, like I would for, for Christmas and when I don't get it, I have a temper tantrum. No, because I am rooted and grounded in the word of truth. Because I am rooted and grounded in his word, I understand that I can pray and whatsoever I ask in his name that he will give it to me. But what I also understand is he's still God. He's still God and I understand in my humanness I may be praying a prayer that is my will and not his will. Listen to me. Jesus went into the garden. If Jesus himself had to go to the garden, understand that this is Jesus, the Jesus, uh, the, the Mary's baby. This is Jesus, the one that was raised up and was born of a virgin. This is Jesus. This is not the Christ. I need you to understand the difference. Christ is not his last name. Christ is the anointing one, the Christos. No, this is Jesus, the one who, uh, who was tempted on all points of, of sin and that he passed the test on all three points. This is Jesus who still went to the garden of Gethsemane to wrestle with thy will be done or my will be done. Jesus himself went to God and said, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass for me. Father, I know you sent me to die for your people, but but if it be your will, let this cup pass. Father, Father, I know when I came from glory from heaven and decided to allow myself to be wrapped in human flesh, I understood what I was being asked to do. But tonight, God, I'm asking, let this cup pass for me if it be your will. And when he received his answer, he then responded, not my will but thy will be done. I think there's a confusion amongst us. 
We don't even understand the difference in our will and his will. And sometimes we're so confused, or thank you, Holy Spirit, blinded by our will. We're so blinded by our plans. We're so blinded by our desires. We are so blinded by the thing we think we should do that we have not fully set in our garden of Gethsemane. And until we are dropping sweats of blood, and you may not drop sweats of blood like Jesus, but what it really means is you sit there and you ponder with that, and you talk to God, and you allow God to talk back to you, and you allow him to do what he did for Saul on the on the road of Damascus. You allowed him to let the scales fall from your eyes. You allowed him to show you, hey, you've been thinking you're serving me, Saul. But listen, no, you've been serving me the wrong way. You've been trying to protect, pro, uh, protect Judaism and I'm trying to birth Christianity. Saul, no, you had it wrong. You had zeal, but you had it wrong. You were taught and you were trained, but you had it wrong. You was raised in the way and in the faith. But but you had it wrong. They raised you up, not just with teaching you the way of Judaism, but they taught you intellectually. You were a scholar, Saul, but you still had it wrong. All that you had been trained to do from a little boy, Saul, you still had it wrong until he hit that road of Damascus and he had an encounter with God that changed not just who he was, but it changed his name. It changed his name. The, the Christians were afraid of him because he was a Christian killer and he thought he was doing the work of the Lord. Listen to me. He thought he was protecting his religion. He thought he was protecting his faith. He was doing it in the name of the Lord. He was doing it in honor to Judaism, protecting the tradition, protecting how he was raised, protecting religion, protecting everything he had taught, protecting how he was brought up and the ways that he was brought up, protecting it all. And he was wrong. Mm. Listen to me. Saul, Paul wrote more of the New Testament than anybody. If, if there was a person like Paul who was once Saul that could be wrong, we could be wrong. Somebody could be wrong in the name of Jesus. Somebody could be wrong and think that they're doing what God has called them to do. Somebody could have been raised. You could have been raised in church and still be doing it wrong. You could have been raised in the streets and came over into the church and thought you had a full conversion experience and still be doing it wrong. Listen to me. Uh, uh, you could be doing it wrong. We've got to humble ourselves. If you've not yet humbled yourself under the mighty hand of God, if you've not yet humbled yourself and say, God, show me the wicked ways, the ways. See, you get confused and you think it's not talking about you because you think, oh, I'm not a wicked person. But he didn't call you wicked, but he said some of your ways were wicked. Listen, the Bible tells us that his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. If you're doing something that's not in accordance with his thoughts or his ways, he is saying, listen to me, church, humble yourself. Turn. Turn means to repent. That's what repentance means, is to turn from. Sometimes we think repentance is lamenting, but you can lament. You can feel sorry about a sin. You can lament. You can feel sorry that you did wrong. You can feel sorry that you got caught and still never repent, still never turn from your wicked ways, still never repent, still never turn away from that which you were doing. I really didn't come on here to talk about this, but this is the vein in which the Holy Spirit is going tonight. So I'm going to submit to God. See, the Bible says submit to God and resist the devil. I'm going to submit to God so that I can resist the devil. It has to go in that order. You can't resist the devil, the enemy, if you have not yet submitted to God. And that's what God needs the church to do today. Today, tonight, tomorrow, submit to God. Turn back. Turn back. We've got to go back to our first love. We've got to go back to when we just care about winning souls and winning people to Jesus. We've got to go back to what he commanded us to do, to make disciples of nations. We've got to go back to teaching people the word of God, the basics, the foundation. We're so busy trying to be deep and people have not yet learned the foundation. Now, let me tell you, it doesn't matter how beautiful a house is. You can have a 10,000 square foot home with marble floors and you can have the, 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 the first 
furniture that you want, five garages with the cars that you desire on the inside of the garages. But if there is a crack in your foundation, it devalues the home. What has happened to the church at large is there has been a crack in the foundation that people have built their ministries. People have built their lives with the crack. With the crack in the foundation. We've got to go back to the foundation. We've got to go back to just teaching Christ and him crucified. We got to go back to teaching that it was Jesus who died on the cross. That Jesus was born of a virgin. That Jesus, he who knew no sin, became sin. That he died on the cross. And that your sin and my sin and the sins and the weight of the world was put on him. Until his father had to turn his way, uh, his back on him, his face from him. He hung on the cross until the sun refused to shine. Until the earth began to tremble. He hung on the cross. He died that you might not only have a right to the tree of life, that you might not only get a, a eternal life, but he died for your freedom. The Bible says that he that the, whom the son is set free is free indeed. He died not just for eternal life, but he died for you to have the victory on this earth. He not only died, he got up on the third day. All power in heaven and earth was given to him. He defeated hell. He defeated death. He defeated the devil and he defeated the grave. He got up so that you could get up. He got up so that you wouldn't be held in any type of bondage. He got up so that systematic racism couldn't hold you. He got up so that drug addiction can't hold you. He got up so that pornography can't hold you. He got up so that whatever trauma and childhood abuse that you uh, incurred, that it can't hold you. He got up. Jesus got up, not just for your eternal life, but the Bible says that he came that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. He did not intend for you to live this life like hell and then die and go to heaven. He got up so that you would have the victory, that all power that was given unto him, that when you come in the name of Jesus, you come getting the same victory. As he is, the Bible says, so are we in this world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. World. He got up so that you would have victory. He got up so that he could reconnect you to the promise in the book of Genesis. Part of what Adam and Eve uh, uh, sent to the pawn shop, if you will, is that they had been, God had told them that they were going to have dominion, that they would subdue, be fruitful, multiply, have dominion and subdue. Subdue is a military term. Take over territory. And when Jesus came and died, he reconnected us to that promise. We are to be fruitful, to multiply. You are to have increase in every area of your life. Life. You are to have be fruitful and multiply to be fruitful mean you have to first create something you have to have fruit to then multiply be fruitful then multiply that's not just talking about the fruit of your womb yet it is including the fruit of your womb be fruitful whatever cre creative idea whatever witty invention that God has given you whatever word of wisdom which is a supernatural answer to a natural problem be fruitful and multiply then he wants you to have dominion and to subdue when Jesus got up, he put you right back in that position. He put you right back in the position to be fruitful, to multiply, to have dominion and to subdue. He who the son is set free, he intended for you to be free in every area, free in your mind, free in your body, free in your marriage, free in your home, free in this country. He intended for you to be free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is not what I came on here to talk about. I came on here to talk about uh, Ephesians chapter six and putting on the whole armor of God. I came on here to talk to you about that, but somebody needs to rest in the freedom. Somebody doesn't understand that Jesus doesn't just care about you getting to heaven. Yes, that was that was uh, first and foremost, but he also cares about the quality of life that you live on this earth. Oh, Elder Dobbins, is that prosperity preacher? Listen, you can call it what you want to. The Bible says, beloved, I wish above all that you would prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. And I'm not saying that that prosperity is talking about being rich, being wealthy. What I'm saying is God didn't intend for you to struggle. He didn't get up for you to have lack. He didn't get up for you to be poor. He didn't get up for you to do without. He didn't get up for you to be bound by generational curses. He got up. And all power in heaven and earth was given unto him. 
At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. At the name of Jesus, Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow. Whether they bow right now on earth or whether they bow when they're crying out in hell saying, Lord, I repent that I didn't call on your name. But at the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow. There is no other name by which man can be saved but Jesus. Hallelujah. Y'all made me preach tonight. That's not what I came on here to do. I, I came really <laughs> to talk about and I can't even go in all of it because we've been on now 31 minutes. So I want to just, I don't know, maybe I should talk about it another night so I could give it in totality and do it justice. But I want somebody on here to know that God loves you with an everlasting love. And that the reconciliation you're seeking in your family, the reconciliation you're seeking in your community in this country, is going to all start when we go back to God. We have got to collectively go back to him. We've got to collectively go back to serving him and him only. We've got to collectively make Jesus Lord. See, see the Bible says, uh, not the Bible says, but the Bible does say in the beginning, God. So we understand from the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning, God. So that's not at the beginning. In the beginning means there's something that existed before. Eternity existed before. But when God decided to create heaven and earth, now there is a in the beginning God. So we understand that God is God, but you have to allow him or let him be Lord. You have to choose to allow him to govern your life. You have to choose to submit to God and to then resist the devil. You have to choose to let God be God and his enemies be scattered. Let every man be a liar. Let every other man be a liar and let God be God, but let God arise and his enemies be scattered. You have to choose. Those are scriptures that I'm naming to you. You have to choose to read your Bible. You have to choose to spend time in prayer. You have to choose to allow him to lead and govern you. That's your choice. It's something I've been saying now for a few weeks that Christianity, yes, we're going to heaven because of what Jesus did. And so we don't, we don't get salvation by works, but salvation produces works. I need you to hear that again. We don't obtain salvation by works because God would not be a just God if it was by works. Because someone may be able to work harder or someone may have more resources or someone may have more abilities. So if it was based on works, it would be based on our individualities. No, we all have to receive salvation uh, we receive it uh, through by, by through grace, but by faith. And so his grace was extended to us. And now we can be a recipient if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart and receive salvation. So we do not obtain salvation through works. But salvation produces works. What does that mean, Elder Dobbins? Salvation. Once I am a recipient of his love, I now give that love. I don't just receive his love. I now give that love. I don't just receive that mercy. I now give mercy. The Bible says, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. So now that I have received salvation, now how I live my life produces works that are evidence that I am a child of the king. Where is the evidence in your life that you are a child of the king? If they took you to court tomorrow, would they find you guilty of being a Christian? Would they find you guilty? Not, ah, uh, thank you, Holy Ghost. Not would they find you guilty of being a Christian. Because you're a Christian the moment you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Would they find you guilty of being a disciple? One who is disciplined in the word. One who is disciplined in prayer. One is who is disciplined to loving their neighbor like they love themselves. One who is disciplined, who is, 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 is disciplined in, in giving the needs and meeting the needs of the poor. Uh, one who is disciplined and caring about those who are in prison because the scripture says I was in prison and you didn't even come to see me. Would they find you guilty of being a disciple? Or would they just find you guilty of when you were 12 years old, you stood in front of your church and said that you accepted Jesus Christ? Where are the works that are being produced by the relationship that you have with God? Listen, listen, 
Listen, we're, we're supposed to be fruitful and multiply. That, that was told us in the book of Genesis. But when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit now is a gift of God, just as salvation is a gift from God. And the Holy Spirit also have gifts. There are gifts of the Spirit, which mean by, by, by it receiving the Holy Spirit, I have access to those gifts. That's all I need to access those gifts is to receive the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit also has fruit of the Spirit. I cannot produce fruit without some work. See, I can receive the gifts of the Spirit easily. They're gifts. They're free of charge. I didn't earn it. I didn't work for it. It is, I'm receiving it as a byproduct of having the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But my fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the fruit of the Spirit is a result of my discipline with the Spirit. It's a result of me spending time. It's a result of the intimate time and fellowship that I have with God. That's the only way I produce fruit. When I'm going through a test and a trial, I'm producing fruit by whether or not I stand in faith, whether or not I stand and wait patiently on the Lord, or whether or not I, 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 I walk away from it and get upset because I didn't get my way. No, it takes stamina to produce fruit. Listen, and it takes intimacy. Too many of of us, our relationships with God, with God is only predicated on what we do in front of others. I'm going to say that again. Too many of us, our relationship with God is only predicated on what we do in front of others. So for many of us out there, believers, people who say they call upon the name of the Lord, when the church closed because their relationship was based solely on what they did in front of others, they only worshiped at church when the worship singer was worshiping. They only prayed at church when the people at church were praying. They only listened to the word when their favorite pastor or pastor was preaching. If they came to church and their favorite pastor wasn't preaching, they might leave and go home because they said this one isn't a preacher or they said things like, oh, I don't like preachers. I just want to hear good teaching. Oh, that's not my style. I don't know. No, no. Too many people, your relationship with God was predicated on too many external circumstances. Thank you, Holy Ghost. But God is looking for an intimate relationship. If, if, if me and my husband only uh, only have a relationship based on what the world can see, then we have no strength to our relationship. We build our relationship behind closed doors. And I'm not just talking about physical intimacy. We build our relationship when we walk through tests and trials together. We build our relationship when we buried my father and saw his body lowered into the ground. We built relationship when our kids were going through and we decided to hang on in there in the intimate times, in the hard times, and stand together. We built our relationship through the fire. We didn't, we didn't uh, build it out in public with people saying hashtag couple goals, hashtag relationship goals. No, the relationship was built in private. Too many of us, our relationship with God is built only in the public. God is asking us. He allowed us to come all back and go back home. He allowed you to go to your house and me to go to my house so that he could now come in our house. Because some of only him, some of us only met him at the church house. We didn't meet him at our house. We never built an altar in our house. We never had Bible study in our house. We never had a prayer meeting in our house. We never had a time that we turned off the TV in our own house and turned off everything and said, let's just wait and listen and wait to hear the Lord. It was all in public. It was all in public. It was all something you could post. It was all something that you could write about. Every time God does something, before you allow it to be cemented in your heart, you get out and you prematurely write about it or talk about it in public. And now the enemy has something to come after and wage war on. We haven't learned how to allow the Lord to give us a word and let it germinate. Let us receive it and let us listen to him and ask him for the perfect timing. That every time he speaks to me, I don't just immediately run and open my mouth and speak. Every time the Lord speaks to me, I don't get on the phone and call the person that the Lord spoke to me about. Sometimes I have to stand in the wisdom of God. He didn't tell me because he wanted me to call them. He told me because he wanted me to bring it to him in private. See, that's why we really don't, I don't know where we're going tonight. We don't really have true intercessors anymore because the intercessors need a pat on their back. Every time they pray for somebody, they need somebody to give them an attaboy. Listen, 
Listen, the problem with prophecy right now, if you want to know what the problem is, it's the prayer life. Because you can only prophesy accurately according to the prayer life that you have with God. When God speaks to the prophets, he is cultivating something with them on the inside. Listen to me. You better go back and read the Old Testament. It's Jeremiah who would have walked away from the people of God. But he, but he said, it's just like fire shut up in my bones. Those are the prophets of old who spent time with God, who would sometimes be rejected by man. See, listen, I don't know when the office of the prophet became popular because it wasn't popular in the Old Testament. When Samuel would come to the city, the people would run in fear because they didn't know what God was saying. But when we start prophesying all of these other things, houses, cars, wives, and husbands, people start clamoring for the prophetic. A real prophet. Oh, Lord, this is not what I was going to talk about tonight. But a real prophet. Mm, most real prophets are not even popular. People don't fully want to hear what they have to say. Real prophets, people are not clamoring for their every word because they understand that they have an ear to God. And some prophets are seers. And li listen, let me just back up and give my testimony. I grew up in the old way. I grew up in the old church, whatever you want to call it, Pentecostal, sanctified, holiness, however you want to label it. But let me tell you something, because I had women of God in my family who didn't even actually call themselves prophets, though they prophesied. Side. Because they, I had women in my family who I knew spent time with God, who I knew spent time in prayer on my behalf. I would be afraid to go to the family dinner because I knew I had been out doing something that I wasn't supposed to. And I'm afraid that God's going to reveal it. See, prophets don't even talk about sin anymore. Prophets are not even telling us to get our house in order anymore. Prophets are not even giving us warnings anymore because prophets have left their post in prayer. Ah, you can only prophesy according to your prayer life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I'm not saying, oh, you got to go pray for five hours. What I'm saying, you need a lifestyle of prayer. See, sometimes you got to walk with God enough and you got to walk in the spirit succinctly enough, especially those of you who believe in being filled with the Holy Spirit. You've got to pray in your prayer language enough that if God needs you right now to go in prayer, you don't have to try to go to your room and pray 30 minutes to pray it up, but that you can hit the throne of heaven just like that. You've got to know how to pray. You've got to practice. I say it this way. Practice the presence of God. I don't mean practice like we talk about practice, like you practice to get better. I mean practice meaning repetition. You've got to go in. The day you go in and you hit a place that you've never been for, I, I, I implore you, go do it again. Go do it again. Go fall in love with it again. Go, go, go do it again. Practice being in his presence. Practice losing yourself in him. Practice laying out on the floor late at night. When you can't sleep, get up and go pray. Go into a prayer closet. Go into a different room and lay out before the Lord when you practice his presence enough listen people are in a fight right now so sometimes you don't have time to go on a three day fast that's why it's supposed to be your lifestyle you're supposed to be able to walk in the spirit so that you do not fulfill the lust of the flesh but also you want to walk in the spirit consistently so that you can access the spirit at any time you don't need to worry was I just listening to all kind of music that's defiling my spirit and now I gotta spend the first 10 minutes repenting you don't need to sit and have to think about did I sleep in a bed last night with somebody who wasn't my husband and now they're calling me to pray for somebody who's sick and now I gotta lay out on my face and feel like I gotta repent listen sin makes cowards of Christians you didn't hear me sin will make you a coward in your faith that's what sin was sent to do. It's going to make you feel condemned. It's going to make you feel not worthy. So for the person on here who's fallen short, listen, the Bible says that if you confess your faults to him, that he is faithful and he is just to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. The problem is when we fall into sin, we don't just run back to him. We sit and wallow in the condemnation. Anytime you feel condemned, that is from the devil. Uh, conde condemnation makes you feel bad. Listen to this. This is the fruit of condemnation. Guilt, shame, 
uh, feeling less than, low self-esteem. All of those are the fruit of condemnation. The fruit of conviction is it turns you back to God. Even the Holy Ghost convicts you, you do not feel condemned. You have a righteous resolve and you repent and you go back to God. You repent. He accepts your forgiveness and you keep walking. See, the problem is when we fall into sin, we just wallow. We just wallow and we just lay there until we have a major consequence. Don't let the enemy fool you. You don't have to have a major consequence. All you have to do is get up, repent, repent, turn away from. It's not just your word. It's not just saying, I'm sorry, Lord. Mm -mm. It's not that. Turn away from. Lord, forgive me. I have sinned against thee. My body, I don't know why I feel led to say this, but my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. I repent for defiling your temple. I repent. Listen, defiling the temple is not just adultery and fornication. Defiling the temple is let no corrupt communication come from your mouth. Defiling the temple is grieve not the Holy Spirit. Defiling the temple comes in so many different ways. Lord, I repent for defiling your temple. This temple belongs to you. You are allowing me to borrow this temple on earth until you decide that you're ready for me to come to heaven. And when I come to heaven, you're going to take me out of this temple because this is not my permanent home. But while I am in this temple, this temple belongs to you. I repent. I thank you for forgiving me. Listen, we tell people all the time, and I know I'm talking fast, and I'm trying not to talk fast, but that's just who I am. I'm trying to slow it down and bring it back. Listen, we tell people all the time, just forgive yourself. I understand what we mean when we say that. But what I'm going to tell you is just receive his forgiveness. <laughs> you didn't shed blood <laughs> to forgive yourself. You didn't shed blood. <laughs> to, Jesus has already forgiven you. What you have to do is simply receive his forgiveness. He's already paid for it. It's already yours. You don't have to beg for it. You don't even have to cry for it. If you want to cry, you can cry. But you do not have to cry to, in order to receive forgiveness. You can just repent. You can just say, Lord, this is it. Listen, we all have those things in our life that we remember that day that we said, I'm not going to do that. Uh, that it ain't even worth it. I'm not going to even do that anymore. No, no, no. I'm not going to do that no more. Lord, forgive me. I'm done. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Listen, it's not worth it. It's not the relationship. I don't know why I can't get away from the relationship tonight. The relationship is not worth it. It's not worth how you feel when it's over. It's not worth the condemnation. It's not worth the shame. It's not worth you feeling like you got to work your way back into the graces of God. No, you don't even have to do that. Just receive his forgiveness and walk away. Walk away from the relationship. That has you going around and around, around and around like the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness. You have been forgiven. You have been forgiven. The blood of Jesus is efficacious. It is strong enough to reach your sin, the sins of your children who aren't born, the sin of your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren that aren't born. It is strong enough. Receive his forgiveness. Ah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we love you. Lord, we worship you. Hallelujah. We thank you, God, for the presence of your Holy Spirit right now. Father God, I thank you for everyone that has been listening in the name of Jesus. Father God, that person that is struggling with walking away, whether they're on here real time or whether they're going to listen back to the playback. Father God, I ask now that you will continue to draw them by the Holy Spirit. And I ask that you would strengthen them, God. Strengthen them in their inner man. The strength that they think they don't have, remind them that you're word says that your strength is made perfect in their weakness. You're not relying on their strength anyway. You are relying on your own strength. And listen to me, whoever this is for, if you submit to God, you will gain his strength. That's why the Bible, this is what I was going to teach over in Ephesians chapter 6, that, that the Apostle Paul first says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Your strength is in God. Once we reconcile that, once we reconcile that our strength is only in God, the strength is not in our abilities, it's not in our intellectual prowess, it's not in our academic achievements, our strength is not in our riches, our strength is not in our beauty. Be strong in the Lord 
and in the power of his might. His strength is made perfect in weakness. Listen, that scripture starts off saying, my grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient for whatever it is he's asking you to do. Listen to me. Whatever God asks you to do, it takes God to serve God. If we could do it without him, we would not have needed Jesus to die. Listen, I'm going to say that again. It takes God to serve God. It takes God to worship God. It takes God to do whatever he's called us to do. So when I say it takes God to do what he's called us to do, the God is the person of the Holy Spirit. That's why God sent the Holy Spirit so that he could empower us to do what God has called us to do because God knows we can't do it without him. His grace is sufficient. Mm -hmm. His grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. Hallelujah. His grace is sufficient. I feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. His grace is sufficient. And I know I preached hard, and I, but I want you to understand this. It's, it's like an old song. There's a sweet, sweet, sweet. It's, it's the sweet presence of the Holy Spirit that I feel right now. The comforter is here right now. The one that's going to comfort you. you you're going to have somebody when you say goodbye, you're going to need the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It's okay to lean into the Holy Spirit. See, we think our feelings are supposed to be in alignment with when we obey God. Sometimes you have to obey God despite your feelings. Sometimes you have to walk away from God when you love what you are walking away from or who you're walking away from. Listen, to serve God is going to cost us something. Hallelujah. It's going to cost you something. The, the, the first thing it costs us is we all got to die to self. Yeah, it takes God. To serve God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we bless you. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's here. Listen, when I say that, I, I don't want you to think I'm being spooky. What I mean is we have invoked the presence of God. <laughs> See, the Bible says that, that he inhabits the praises of his people. When you speak well of him, you are now allowing yourself to become a, a place of habitation for him. No longer do we need visitation. See, in the Old Testament, they had to have visitations, but the Holy Spirit is dwelling in the earth realm. We can have a constant habitation with God. He inhabits the praises of your people. Thank you for putting that scripture, Minister uh, Lewis. Dying to yourself, Luke 9 and 23. The Bible also says, Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. I, I think we've done you all a disservice uh, in this season of church uh, because we don't tell you that it's going to cost you everything to serve God. Does that mean you're going to have to give up everything? No, it means you're going to have to surrender everything to God. And sometimes when you begin to surrender things to God, then he can show you what he has no need for. Listen, that's all circumcision was in the Old Testament. It was a piece of the foreskin on, on, the, on the men that had no use or value. So you cut it off. <laughs> that's what we need to tell God to do. The pieces that have no use or value in the kingdom, we need to cut it off. Circumcise our heart. Purify our hearts. Those are prayers we don't pray anymore. Lord, show me. It was an old song that said, if you find anything in me that shouldn't be, take it out, Lord, and strengthen me. That's what the song said. Because sometimes what, what we have to give up is what we think we need. So we need him to come and strengthen us. But there's a part that he has no use for. It's not useful in the kingdom. So you begin to surrender everything. You know, we sing it, I surrender all, all to thee. But do we really surrender it all? <laughs> do we really give it? Do we really give him the marriage? Do we, do we really give him uh, our hopes, our dreams, our visions, and allow him to speak back to us and say, actually, that's not the plan I have for you? Or perhaps it is. But do we allow him the opportunity to speak in that area or do we wait until everything crumbles and then we say, speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. 
I came on here to talk about one thing. I did not. <laughs> so we just went um, in the way that the Holy Spirit would have us to go. Again, if you are a woman on here, and I know it's not only women on here, I highly urge you to just join the Art of Hearing class. You can register at the link in my bio. There is the link that will take you directly to the Art of Hearing. Or if you want to go to Christy.com, Dobbins.com, there is a link. Uh, if you have not, I'd like for you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. There is more teaching there. As I stated earlier, I do plan to pray specifically and call the names of those um, on the prayer requests on Instagram. And I will post that later um, this week. I, I, we will be posting um, yesterday's sermon that that took a turn. I thought I was so tonight I was coming on Instagram to really finish teaching what I started teaching before the Holy Spirit took over at closing the gap yesterday. But we will post that um, in its entirety, that sermon tomorrow and just the demonstration of prayer that went forth afterward. Um, I, I, I'm praying for you all. I'm believing God's best for his people. I'm believing God for his best for this country. I'm, I'm believing God to um, to reconcile his church fully back to him. I understand, and we've seen it all year, um, that, that this year um, many things and systems have fallen, things that we've grown comfortable with. And, and God is just saying, I want to bring my people higher in me. And so he he's pulled us away to him to take us higher in him. And I think we have to go back to understanding that God is God. God is God. God is God. Listen, let God be true and every man a liar. God is God. God is God. I want you to understand he's still God. He is on the throne. He is in control. He who began a good work in you is going to perform it. God is still God. He still loves you with an everlasting love. If you've fallen short, I want you. I, I was talking to a friend today and I said, and I'm, I'm guilty myself. The word came up out of me. So when the word comes up out of me and it's not from me, I understand that it's also for me. And, the, and I said, the Lord is, I just want us to get into a season of swift repentance. Because it's taken us too long to turn and change from some things that we've done for a long time. And we want to just start saying, okay, Lord, you said that. I'm sorry. I repent and turn away from. I want you to remember that repentance is turning away from. Don't get caught up in crying out and feeling sorry and crying about it. That's lamenting. But to re repent means there is some visible change that is taking place when you say, Lord, I repent. I want to remind somebody that God is love and that even in his correction, he loves you. The blood of Jesus prevents him from killing us all. You know, in the Old Testament, when he would just utterly destroy, but the blood of Jesus repent, prevents him from killing us all because when he looks down, he sees the blood. But I don't want us to take his grace for granted. Romans 6 and 1 says, shall we continue in sin? That grace may abound, God forbid. So I want us to take it seriously. I'm praying for you all, uh, believing God's best for you, believing God's best for us. I will try to be more diligent and consistent uh, with jumping on and sharing what the Lord is saying. I believe he's saying to me, I don't want you to grow weary in well-doing. I don't want you to get caught up in the political fray that's going on right now. I, I don't want you to be anxious and full of anxiety. I want us to stable ourselves in the Lord. And in order to do that, sometimes you have to just, my pastor said it this way this morning, you have to shut out all of the noise. And um, it's a lot of noise going on. But listen, the way you guard your heart is to guard what you hear and guard what you see. The way you build yourself up is to see the right things, reading the word of God, hearing the right things. Somebody needs to just let the word of God play on your Bible app. 
that anxiety that you're feeling at night when you get ready to go to sleep and, and all of these things the enemy is bringing to your mind that will prevent you from sleeping and to have restlessness. No, 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 no. We're going to put on the Bible. The Bible says, Jesus said, I sent my word and it healed him. So we don't understand the strength and the power that's in the word of God. Is there a particular scripture? They're all, they're all his words. Just start playing wherever you felt, felt led. If you want to start in the gospel, start in the gospels. But wherever you, if you want to play the Psalms and you want to play them all night, but wherever you feel led, don't get caught up on what do I listen to? Don't, Somebody will, but don't DM and say, Elder Christie, what should I listen to? I want you to understand that the Bible says all scripture is, is inspired by God. So all of it is powerful. All of it has value. All of it is profitable. That's what the Bible says. All of it is profitable. And so I want you to understand that God is with you. God is in you and God is for you. And so I'm praying that you have a blessed week this week. Again, if you have not registered for the Art of Hearing, you can do so. The link is in my bio. Um, that class starts on November 30th. And we just praying God's best for you. May the Lord bless each of you real good. God bless you. They said, what Bible app? Um, oh, I'm on my phone. I was looking for my phone. Uh, I, I don't know. Someone can put the name in there. I think it's just called the Bible app. Um, is you version, you version is the Bible app that I use. I believe that's it. Uh, but whatever Bible, yeah, it's you version. Thank you, April. Whatever Bible app that you choose to use, but I use you version. Um, and just, it's a option to play audio so that you can hear the word and you can bathe the word of God, your mind with the word of God. And I want you to know you might be asleep, but your spirit man is never asleep. So you don't know what your spirit man is absorbing and what is being deposited in your spirit. You don't, you won't know until you start feeling stronger in the Lord. That's, it's important. I want you to remember to, to be strong in the Lord. And so that's what's important as believers that our strength is made perfect. Uh, his strength is made perfect in our weakness and that we rely on him, particularly during these times. I'm praying for you all. May God bless you. May he keep you is my prayer. God bless you. Good night.